The truth is that now what we need to do is adapt with impatience. And people say, well, that's not scientific. I said, well, then our science has to change, right, to make it patient-centered. And, you know, this idea of a control. Well, if the control isn't as good, why are we doing that? It's not about drug A versus B. That's the old way we've done it, and that's how you get your regulatory path. But why can't we get a regulatory path that says, if you can get this patient to a complete response in a less toxic way, you get approval for that? Well, we need, basically, a very large, very scientifically designed effort to find out what works. And that is the argument behind what is the largest study that NIH has mounted ever, which, when it is completely enrolled, will follow one million Americans asking them to be our partners, share their electronic health records, provide blood samples that can be subjected to complete DNA sequencing, uh, walk around with Fitbits and other wearable sensors to keep track of what's happening to them, answer lots of questionnaires, and stay in touch about what's happening over time. And it's going to be a very diverse population with more than half of them of racial and ethnic minorities and also oversampling rural groups and people of lower SES status. We've already enrolled 277,000, and the numbers are growing. And that's just over a year and a half. And imagine you have this as a platform for all the other things you'd like to do to understand wellness. Some of these people will have chronic illness. It'll be a great opportunity to find out how best to manage those. Mm -hmm. Some of those people will come down with cancer. They're already highly motivated. You've got all this legacy data. They're pre-consented for recontact. So enrolling in follow-up trials ought to be fairly straightforward in this situation. But we are going to learn from that what really matters as far as the individual assessment of what it takes to keep you healthy.